Welcome back to A Filmography of One, the show where we look at good movies from directors who only ever made one feature film. And today we're looking at three directors. Remy Belvoir, Andre Bonzel, and Benoit Poelvorde. Yeah, you see why I called this video Man Bites Dog and didn't try to list their names? These three gentlemen are from Belgium, hence the names. They all met in film school and would all collaborate on a short film in 1987 called Pass de C4 pour Daniel Daniel, or No C4 for Daniel Daniel. The short film would also feature Belvaux's brother, Lucas Belvaux, who would began acting a few years earlier in 1981. Interestingly, Lucas has gone on to direct a few films himself. None as well received as Man Bites Dog, but more than one. In 1992, the three friends would put together a film to show off their writing, directing, and acting abilities. Man Bites Dog. The film is a fake documentary where a small crew follows around a serial killer on his day-to-day -day activities, including visiting his family, his day job developing film, and of course, murdering people. But soon, the film crew begins to find themselves complacent in these killings until their involvement escalates to actively helping the killer. Benoit would take the lead as a serial killer named Ben, with Remy and Andre playing a director and cinematographer named Remy and Andre. Good job with those names, guys. The idea of the film was that it could be shot without any money. The film, diegetically, was being filmed by a small crew, justifying the relative sloppiness and low production value of the film. It was also a story that wouldn't require a lot of actors. In fact, Ben's parents in the movie are Ben's actual parents, who apparently didn't know this was a movie and thought they were just filming actual documentary footage. I like to include music from the film in these videos, but, uh... There's no music in this movie, so I guess they beat the Coen brothers to that by like 16 years. Now, probably the reason there's no music is that they just couldn't afford any, but it's pretty effective, especially in the end credits. Like, jeez, this is uncomfortably silent. The film is very dark, yet darkly comedic in spots? I don't know that this was supposed to be a flat-out comedy, it is pretty fucked up, but there are some really funny jokes. The film has been both praised and criticized for its violence. It's pretty clear it's meant to be taken as a criticism of violent, exploitative media, but some people think it falls into the same exploitative tropes it criticizes. It's like Cannibal Holocaust for the 90s. And maybe it's too weird and dark to be everyone's thing, but as many longtime viewers know, I have quite an affinity for serial killer jokes. It dips a bit into mean-spirited territory, and I think there's stuff you could cut to make a more compelling movie. But as it is, it's more than worth the watch for fans of violent movies. And I'm clearly not alone in enjoying this movie. It stands at a 7.5 on IMDb and 72% on Rotten Tomatoes, both decidedly high scores. It was prestigious enough to get a Criterion release, though I think it's out of print. At the very least, it's not on Blu-ray. It would play at Cannes, where it won Special Award of the Youth, as well as an award from the Belgian Film Critics Association. Now usually in these videos I have to pose some question like, why didn't this film succeed? But, um, this was a black and white student film from Belgium that was rated NC-17 upon release, so... Why was it so successful? Part of that was likely the can accolades and good word of mouth, but it just feels like really good timing. The early 90s was a great time for indie movies, but specifically, 1992 was, for reasons beyond my explanation, a really good year for super violent movies. Sam Raimi concluded one of the bloodiest trilogies ever with Army of Darkness. Peter Jackson released what was probably the bloodiest movie I've ever seen, Dead Alive. We got John Woo's Hard Boiled and Abel Ferreira's Bad Lieutenant. This was a year so violent it birthed Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez. The audience was definitely there for something this fucked up. So what happened to these three gentlemen? To start with, Ben was clearly not big on the directing aspect. He was the star director, and he went on to be a moderately successful actor in Belgium. He was even in A Town Called Panic, which is a pretty good movie. 
I feel like that's a pretty straightforward situation. He wanted to act, not direct. Andre played the cameraman, and he went on to do camera work in some other movies, though nothing you've likely heard of. He is set to direct another movie, so he might have a filmography of more than one. But as of now, very little's known about the film, so we'll see what happens. Remy, I think, is the most tragic. He seems like the one most likely to go on to direct, but he ended up doing almost nothing for 15 years before taking his own life at the age of 39. And 15 years is a long time to go without directing. Maybe he'd had his taste of fame and was ready to go out on top. Or maybe he was trying to get a second feature together and it never came to fruition. Maybe his failure to get a second feature contributed to his suicide. I don't know, I can only tell you what they say online. Boy, that's a bit of a downer to end this episode on. Surely there's, like, some comic relief I can find in here. Oh, there we go. In 1998, Remy and three other guys circled Bill Gates and threw a pie in his face. Ha <laughs> ha, getting pied in the face will never not be funny. Unfortunately, it seems Remy, as well as probably Pinoy and maybe even Andre, will forever have a filmography of one. Until next time, I'm Matt, and I hope you have a nice day.